Okay, and we are live. Hey friends, welcome back to my channel. Today, it is my great honor to host Jannie Wirtz, author of The Wars of Light and Shadow, to Ride Hell's Chasm, the co-author of the Empire Trilogy, The Cycle of Fire, and I know there's a whole bunch of other ones. Jannie, thank you so much for being here today. You're welcome. Thank you, Tori, for having me. We've got some people on already that are familiar faces. Hi, Andrew. Hey, Andrew. Hello, Palmer, Chris Navo. Hello, everybody. Feel free wow. as we go. If you have any questions for Jannie, feel free to drop those in the chat and I will do my best to get to them. I also have a bunch of questions for Jannie. So we will see how much we can pack into this conversation. Um, but the first question that I wanted to ask you, Jannie, was why fantasy? For you as a writer, what drew you to fantasy as a genre and kept you in it for so long? The very fixated idea of human prejudice and mm. that the minute you say something and it bounces off of somebody's real world hotspots or hot buttons, they react and they turn off. And fantasy mm. allowed me to write outside the envelope and slide things in there and literally go at subject matter with the gloves off mm. and slip ideas and thought in that normally people would react or bounce off. You know, if you say a word about some one of their most cherished beliefs, you can do yeah. it in a fantasy and it's not offensive because they can say, this is fake, it's not real. Mm. Also, I was struggling in college to decide which direction I wanted to go. And I tried science and I tried all these different subjects and I had just too many entrants to cram into one box. And I realized really early on that I was not cut out to be an academic. I was not cut out to conform. I was not cut out to be told what to do. I was not to be cut out to honor limitations for the sake of, because my older generation said, sorry, you can't. <laughs> that was an immediate red flag of, for me to go, why the heck not? So <laughs> fantasy allowed me to break the envelope in ways that are not acceptable to science or not acceptable to social thinking or social norms that are not acceptable to whatever barrier people build around themselves to protect their beliefs or ideas. Mm -hmm. So um, I almost couldn't help it. It let me draw outside the lines very freely. Yeah. Well, no Plus, it let me bring every single crazy wild hair interest I ever did into play on the page. No matter what crazy curiosity I had in real life and pursued, it was just fodder to go into the books. Well, and that's something that I think I've noticed about a lot of fantasy writers and readers is that they all seem to have just such a myriad of interests. And I think as writers that that actually is a huge bonus for you know, story content, because it allows us to kind of dip into lots of different areas of life. Um, let's see. Palmer had a, in other words, you're <laughs> <laughs> No. <laughs> Andrew, that I feel like a lot of us fantasy writers are, are, don't enjoy being put in boxes. I would say I could probably classify a lot of fantasy authors that way. I think it stems from we hate the reality we're living in. So mm. we're going to invent one that's better or worse or, mm -hmm. you know, the playground that society gives you is just too restrictive. Yeah. And our minds were not built to be restricted. Totally. Agree. No matter how many people try to cage it and control it, our imaginations were not meant to be restricted. Totally agree. I'd like to say that the Empire Trilogy blew my mind back in the 80s and 90s. Thank you, Jenny. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank Ray, too. <laughs> it was a 50-50 prospect. We both worked on every aspect of that. Yeah, I'm excited. I have a, I have a question for you in here about co-writing, because I, I find that um, really fascinating when two authors come together to create a, a single story, because I just I'm amazed that um, with two different writing styles, and I might as well just ask you that now since we dipped into it, with two different writing styles, how do you create one cohesive story when you're bringing in, is it easier, is it harder? You're gonna write two thirds of the book yourself. Both <laughs> sides are gonna write two thirds of the book, so don't ever do it because you think it's going to be easier. Mm -hmm. Don't necessarily do it with your best friend because as many <laughs> times as it can work, 
there are just as many times that it can't. Mm. One of the reasons why it worked between Ray and I was we hammered out a contract before we started that very clearly mm. stated it was Ray's uni universe. It very clearly said what would happen if somebody dropped out in the middle. Mm. It very clearly stated what would happen if, if the worst case scenario went wrong. Mm -hmm. And embarking on it, you can't take your ego with you. You have to check mm. that at the door. You have to, because you're not writing your book. You're not writing their book. You're writing a third voice. Yeah. And part of the way Ray and I survived it was we lived on the opposite coast and we sent files back and forth and we changed them every which way that we wanted to and send it to the other person. We did not track changes. Oh, okay. So all I ever saw was what Ray sent to me. All Ray ever saw was I sent back to him. And if a stitch got dropped, I could pick it up and add it. If I threw something in there that wasn't connected, I could connect it. So in the end, we didn't have that ego push of, oh, you you slaughtered my baby sentence here, you mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. um, and we threw each other curves quite regularly. And for the two of us, because we weren't invested in it being my book or his book, it was our book, yep. we were able to let go. Sure. The few times that we hit head on head, where I wanted it to do this and Ray wanted it to do that. And we bashed heads and deep, nobody would move. We just kept talking until we came up with a third direction. And the third way was always better. Yeah. Infallibly, the third way was better. So if you're really tight about being in control of what you write, if your ego is so thoroughly invested, if every word you write is, a, is your baby, mm -hmm. it is for my solo work. But yeah. if you're gonna collaborate, no. You really have to be able to be flexible that way and just let the outcome happen. And if it's not going to work, you'll probably know it pretty quickly. Yeah. So, because just as many collaborations, they end up enemies and not talking. Ray and I are still good friends. Yeah. And you created, from what I've heard, a pretty amazing trilogy on top of it. I'm very excited to read it. It's a piece of work. And it <laughs> went in some directions I did not expect. I did not expect we were writing subversive women's literature. <laughs> but I had people come up to me from Asian cultures with their translators telling me we're reading this around the kitchen table with a wow. translator. Um, because of course over there, book two and three did not get published. So um, there were things that happened unexpectedly with that. So I'm very yeah. proud of that piece of work. Um, I'm also annoyed because it's so overshadowed. A lot of people go, oh, we didn't know you had another career. <laughs> I had four novels before it and yeah what 17 of them after it yeah so um but that's pretty typical I mean the way our culture is set up so it's unsurprising that it happened that way I'm just pleased it's it's found the hearts of so many people everyone wants yeah. their books to do that and even if this one's only half mine better than none right yeah. Yeah. Well, and especially when it can make such an obvious difference for, you know, people that maybe don't see themselves represented in a certain genre as much. It was certainly written ahead of its time, but neither of us realized that. Yeah. In the moment. It, it just never occurred to us. Yeah. Yeah. We were just telling the story and that's what finally got me. Ray was after me for two years to do this project. And I kept saying, no, 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 no. I got this huge wars of light and shadow. I want to get to that. And finally, the story won me over. Mm. I said, I want to be part of writing this story. It's going to be amazing. Yeah. So that's exactly what happened. Yeah. So for your solo writing process, what does that typically, and I know you say that it's different. You've kind of mentioned before, and it's usually different every time, but do you have a common thread to your writing process from when that first idea comes in to your you know, final draft? Nope. <laughs> They're all different. My first novel, Sorcerer's Legacy, began as a joke. <laughs> I'm serious. Yeah, I it love it. It began as a joke because I was writing and illustrating. I always I was exposed to Howard Pyle very early, mm -hmm. and that was to my detriment because I said, oh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to mm -hmm. write and illustrate. And everybody kept saying, no, 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 you can't. You better specialize. And I said, screw specialization. Only insects specialize, as Buckminster Fuller said. <laughs> <laughs> so here I was struggling to learn to draw on the job and I was sending a painting to 
Great to Great Britain for the Worldcon, and I had an agent going to carry the painting because I was living in a garret on a farm. I couldn't afford to send myself to Britain. So I had this painting going, and I had an unair conditioned field hands quarters over a carriage house, and it was like 103 degrees, and uh. it had a slate roof. The sun would just beat down. So I said, "It's it's July, it's hot. I'm going to paint a snow scene." <laughs> So I'm painting this picture and I had this wizard and I had this pretty girl and I had this magic going on. And suddenly the agent calls up and she says, I have to fill out paperwork to send the painting to Britain ahead of time. And so I need the painting in my hands a month early and I hadn't finished the jewelry. So I finished the jewelry off in colored pencil on what was an acrylic painting. So I told her, you can't sell the painting. It isn't finished. It needs to come back from Britain and I need to finish it. Yeah. And she just decided not to listen. She kept calling me up and asking me what the price tag was because she wanted to make money. So I finally said, you can't sell this painting. There's a story attached because that was the only thing that locked a painting is not for sale in her book was it went to a book. Mm -hmm. So I sat down and wrote 18 pages of the most impossible drivel I could imagine, shoving the heroine in so much trouble she could never get out. 18 pages, boom, in like half an hour wow. and threw it in the file box. Meantime, I was part of a small writing group. We used to get together once a month and it had been too hot and none of us were living in air conditioning. Nobody had central air in those days. Yeah. So they came to my garret and they all said, we haven't been writing at all. And we got all this Coca-Cola and M&Ms. <laughs> we're set for the afternoon. Good writer, so dude. <laughs> there's your file cabinet. Of course you have something in there we haven't seen. So I said, I'll fix these guys. And most of the group was men, I should add. I pulled that thing out of the file box and threw it out there and they go, oh, this is really good. We think this will sell. And I'm like laughing my head off saying, there's no way to end this thing. And then typical Wurt's mind, the minute you say can't. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there is a way to finish this. <laughs> so I did. I finished it and it became my first novel and it was kind of like the, the sore thumb sticking out in the wrong direction because it's really different than anything else. But that's what led to the empire because it had mm. a heroine instead of a male lead. So there's the story behind Sorcerer's Legacy. I'm proud of that book. Yeah. It's totally different. I wrote every chapter a cliffhanger because I knew that if you put down a, a novelist's first book, you never tr spend your money again. Mm. So Sorcerer's Legacy became my first novel. Yeah. Here you go. All because of a painting that I had to tell a greedy agent she couldn't sell out for money. <laughs> <laughs> so for for somebody who's who is writing their their first novel and, and getting ready to, you know, think about publishing and what are some of the things that you would say are important to keep in mind specifically for your first novel? I would say three things. Read read, 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 and read. Because you can't write without vocabulary. You can't write without a sense of how stories develop. You can't write without a good feel for grammar, even if your education was lacking. Reading books is going to give you direct hands-on experience of what other authors have done. And not necessarily reading just what was done this generation. Go to the library and read some of the older stuff read some of the classics, figure out what was going on in those books. So read. Number two, life experience. You can't write a book having only sat in a chair. Mm -hmm. Go out and do things. Chase your interests. Interact with people. Go out in public and do stuff that you love to do and do it alone because then your observer is going to be switched on without a pal. Turn off your telephone and watch people interact. Mm -hmm. So live. That's the second one. The third one is walk or run. Do not walk. Pick up a book called Techniques of the Selling Writer by Dwight V. Swain, S-W-A-I-N. It's published by the University of Oklahoma Press in trade paperback. It is still in print. Get that book and get another book called Story by Robert McKee, mm. which was written for script writers. The first one Techniques as a Selling Writer is going to show you the writer's toolbox. It's going to teach you how to construct sentence by sentence fiction so the reader can access it. The second book is going to tell you what kind of book you're writing. 
Is it an extrovert book a survival story? Is it an introverted book? Is it a combination of both? Or is it an art book or a literary book? So script writing is no different. An art film moves very differently than an action thriller. Mm -hmm. So knowing what kind of story you're writing and then knowing how to construct a scene and what starts a scene and completes a scene and why that scene works as opposed to just a conglomeration of paragraphs. A scene is gonna hand you a twist and a surprise every time. It's gonna open up something that you didn't expect, whether it's mood, whether it's something about the character, whether it's something about your plot, whether it's whatever it is, every scene has to have that little spark in it. And story mm -hmm. by McKee is dry as dust to read, but it teaches you what to look for. Sure. So especially writing short fiction, I found that one very handy because it told me whether I had a story or not. Mm -hmm. It told me whether I had something that was really going to work or not, because not every idea is worth writing. Right. Ideas are a dime a dozen, good books are not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, with you, you've written so many different forms of storytelling from the novellas to the short fiction, to the standalone novels, to the trilogy, to this, you know, massive epic fantasy series. Um, do you feel like it's important to write in a lot of different formats as a writer as, as kind of a challenge to yourself to keep growing and, and experiencing new ways of storytelling? No, I don't. I think everybody mm -hmm. creates individually. If you don't work with short fiction, don't do it. Short fiction is hard. If I let short fiction off the leash, it becomes a novel. <laughs> Same. <laughs> So if it doesn't suit, you don't do it. There yeah. are some writers who only write short fiction. They can't stand to stay in the same setting all that time. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody like Zelazny, he did like 500 something short stories. I mean, I helped do a compilation of, of his life work. He did novels, he did novellas, he did short stories. He was excellent at doing extreme short fiction. Yeah. So no, I don't like rules. <laughs> you really have to go with your gut. If it's yeah. if it's slogging for you, if it's going uphill, don't do it. Yeah. On the other hand, learning how to write short fiction can be very valuable because it teaches you what you can chuck out. Yeah. But you really have to take things at your speed because there are no rules when it comes to creativity. The only yeah. rule I have is does it get me excited to to work on it? Yeah. And that can be different day to day, book to book generation to generation, time time of life to time of life, what motivates you to write can be different. So you're gonna have to keep reinventing. Mm -hmm. And whatever keeps that spark of enthusiasm to make you want to keep reinventing, that is your path and stick to it. And I don't care who tells you differently. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think it is really important because one of the things I've I've learned from doing diff like interviews with so many different authors and talking to different people within the community is that it's it's easy to kind of fall into the, this is how a book is written. Whereas everybody has such a different process and different passions and different things that get them excited to write. And that's one of the reasons why it's such a beautiful um, craft, I think is because there is something for everyone, be it reader or author. There's a stage that just about every writer goes through where you start to learn your craft and then your little editor gets going and they people complain, I can't read. Now that I write, I can't read. I can never read again because mm. everything I pick up, I'm critical of it. That's bullshit. <laughs> That's bullshit. It just means that you're still learning your craft and everything's rubbing the wrong way and you're so stuck in the rules. You're applying a bunch of scotch tape and paper rules to everything on a page. Mm -hmm. This too shall pass. Mm -hmm. it's just your your discernment of what you're seeing on the page is blinded yeah. by your own process and your own groping to learn what it is because you're not confident in what you're doing yet to be able to let go and let somebody else's writing take you. Yeah. So your own critical editor, good thing to learn to turn it off, but there will be a stage or maybe a stage where you can't read books. But yeah. Don't go blaring all over the internet. No, I'm a writer. I can't read anymore. That just shows how stupid and wet behind the ears you are <laughs> to those of us looking on. Because if you came to reading and that was one of the great loves of your life, you're not going to give it up just because you're writing. Yeah. Some writers do and they brag about it. 
And I'm like, what? You just cut off your arm to spite your face. <laughs> yeah. Yep. You just cut off your legs. This is part yeah. of the thrill is seeing what other people do. And you know, you're never going to be the best at anything. There's always going to be someone doing it better. So get off your egotistical horse and live. Yeah, absolutely. Totally agree. So don't um, be a writing snob. You know, if you're in that critical process, shut your mouth and get over it. Yeah. And it may take a year or two, but you will. Yeah. So in, in those days where, you know, not necessarily if somebody is um, having a hard time with, with reading, but if you have those days where you're, we talked a little bit before we went live about the quit days. <laughs> um, I feel like every writer has those days where you get, you know, that imposter syndrome really comes up and, and don't use that word. Sorry. It, is so misused. <laughs> it is so misused and so it's it's craven if you're doing it you're doing it so quit yeah. pretending you're not you know right. so don't dig a hole for yourself that doesn't exist because people have put this little cushy woolly term around oh ooh, you get to feel undeserving all human beings feel undeserving sometimes get over it get over it because you're part of the the bigger creation here. Yeah. It's so arrogant to say, I know better that I don't deserve what I've got. What, you know better than whatever put you here? Mm -hmm. That is arrogant. That is, you're meant to come down here and make mistakes. So make your mistakes and be proud of them and pick yourself up and learn. Why do yeah. we fall down? You know, that from the Batman movie to learn how to get back up again. So I don't buy imposter syndrome except as some way to just cushion the let's protect our undeservingness, which is arrogant mm. because our minds and our, our beings were made to be curious. Mm -hmm. So get over it. Quit being a snob about it. Get over it and get on with what you were put here to do, which was to push boundaries. Mm -hmm. So you were saying um, on quit days, mm -hmm. I have a way of handling quit days, three different ways. Okay. One of them is, you don't have the spark that you need to write that scene just yet. Mm -hmm. And you're not really blocked and you're not really quitting. You just don't have all the pieces. Yeah. So don't sweat it. Keep asking the question to yourself every hour. Sleep on it a few times. Go out and do something outdoors. Take the break you need to do and honor the fact that I read a book a long time ago about... Um, opening thing, open thinking, open thinking does not happen when you're sitting in a chair. When you put your body in stillness, it locks your mind into a one point space. Mm. When your body is moving, it opens your doors of your mind and it allows your subconscious to bring the solutions to the surface. Why do you always get the idea when you're getting ready to go on an errand? Duh, you moved. Mm -hmm. Why do you get it in the shower? Why do you get it when you're a mile away from a pencil on a walk? Mm -hmm. Why do you get it in the middle of the night? So open thinking requires movement. Yeah. So go for a walk, vacuum the rug, do some other thing with the attitude that you're opening your mind, even to get up and do 10 jumping jacks sometimes. So break that stillness, sitting at the desk, staring at the screen is not going to fix it. Yep. So that's one thing. So I call those pause points because you don't have the pieces and sometimes it can take three days to get them. I don't panic. Yeah. I let that process happen and I've written enough. It always does. Mm. The second thing that can happen, you're bored because go being back to Robert McKee, that little surprise in that scene isn't there yet. Mm. So why isn't it there yet? You might be telling it from the wrong point of view. You might have started that scene at the wrong place. You should start it as a flashback or start it as a 10 minutes later or start it in the middle of the action or so where, or you chose to show a scene that didn't need to be shown. Right. It needed to be one sentence recap, a piece of narrative between scenes and the real scene is the one that you're suppressing. Yeah. So that's just a case of you got the wrong puzzle piece in your hand. You have all the puzzle pieces. You just tackled it from the wrong direction. Yeah. The third problem is real true writer's block. And that happens for two reasons that I can see. One is 
you have your editor turned on. Mm -hmm. And one thing that's true, writing and inspiration are intuitive. You start at point A, you project where you want to be at point B, where you want to end that scene or that book. You don't know what's in between. You don't have to know. Yeah. Your brain is going to solve that. You have to leap out into space and allow that intuitive step to happen. In hindsight, your logic is going to work, yeah. but it won't work going forward. You cannot logic creativity. Yep. Creativity is not logical. <laughs> Wrong side of the brain. Editing is logical. So yeah. you have to separate the creator. The creator is intuitive. The creator doesn't care what they put on the page. The creator mm -hmm. doesn't criticize it. The creator spews it out there and just plays with the word knowing that when it comes time to edit, logic's going to be applied and you have something to work with. It's like clay. Mm -hmm. You can't sculpt a finished sculpture out of a piece of wet clay. Yeah. So you play on the page as much as you want. If your editor tells you, oh, this sentence is garbage, you shut it down and squash mm -hmm. it because a garbage sentence can be fixed. You don't care. Yeah. So if you're trying to create, which is intuitive and playful, and destroy, which is edit and logical, on the same page, you're going to lock up because you're going to critic everything you do and your free-flowing, creative, intuitive mind cannot work yeah. on logic. So if you're trying to create and destroy at the same time, you're going to stop yourself dead and cold. If you're listening to the reviewers, you're going to stop yourself. That's the critic. Mm -hmm. So you got to pitch out the critic that tells you no good. You got to pitch out the critic that says you don't deserve. You got to pitch out the critic that says anything you're putting on the page has to matter. It doesn't. Mm -hmm. All that counts is that you're writing. Mm -hmm. It's like Norman Rockwell started every painting for the Saturday evening post with a lamppost. Mm -hmm. And he would draw what happened around that lamppost till he came up with the picture he was going to paint. The lamppost mm -hmm. was the way that he started so if you can't write anything, sit down and type garbage, type <laughs> words that don't fit. Yeah. Type nonsense. I guarantee you after two pages, your brain is going to be sick of writing nonsense and something's going to start to happen. Yeah. So break the glass that says you got to put yourself in a box. So you cannot create and destroy on the same page. If you absolutely can't get the habit of editing today, then go back to a prior scene and work on that. Mm -hmm. So if yeah. your editor, so if, and that comes to the next step, which is your real life problem. If your real life problem is bigger than the problem your characters are going through, for some writers, that's a spark that fuels them. Mm -hmm. For other writers, it kills them dead. I'm one mm -hmm. of those. Kills me yeah. dead. Same. My mother's in the hospital. Forget it. Yeah. I'm not writing. So if that happens to you, then yeah. you have to recognize that writing is not your priority today. Mm -hmm. Your real life is taking a precedent and honor that because that is your life telling you, you need to be somewhere else right now. And there's no problem. You're not really blocked. You're not really having a quit day. Yeah. Something else, your kid or your family or your whatever was more important. I mean, my mm -hmm. cat sliced her cornea. It was more important. I took her to the vet yeah. and finished the painting that was on the easel. Yeah. So acknowledge your real life. Yeah. Um, and acknowledge that sometimes there's something on your mind that's just too big. So process that first. The writing's going to be there. The words do not walk off the page and disappear. <laughs> right. Yeah. They're going well, to be there. And, and there, so I, I will add also there. that menopause for women can create this. And yeah. it can go on for a couple of years. And don't panic. <laughs> it's going to come back. It'll absolutely come back, but your creativity may not flow the same way. You may create differently than you ever did before. Yeah. So get used to that. But I've seen too many women writers panic when mm -hmm. that shutdown can happen. It's just hormonal. It, there's nothing we can do about it. You just have to survive it. And I'm always available to talk to people that hit that wall. But I think it's something too little talked about. Yeah, 100%. Um. So, and the other thing that can stop you is telling yourself you're not worth it. Mm. Surprise, there's that arrogance that says that my words are not worth anybody else's words. Mm. Somebody else's words are more important than my words. This is baloney. If we were all meant to be alike or be, be measured by the same standard, we would be born with the same attitude. You know, you never 
your DNA is 100% unique. It's never happened in history before. It will never happen in history again. So get off it because if you don't write that story, nobody else will. Mm -hmm. You just robbed the entire universe of what your individual DNA could contribute and your individual experience could contribute. That's my two penny lecture that appears in the dedication of one of my novels. Yeah. Get off the arrogance that you don't mean anything because that will give you a quit day too, is telling yourself that whatever you're doing just isn't worth it. I'm telling you a hundred times, a thousand times, I was told my Wars of Light and Shadow was not worth it. If I had listened, I would have killed a piece of myself. Mm -hmm. And that whole work, which is now completed and can be discovered for what it is, would have been thrown away because of somebody else's bullshit. Mm -hmm. Not happening. Yeah. Don't ever, 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 ever give yourself away for anyone else. Yeah. Because they are not you and it is not their right to decide and you don't need to listen. So that's my thing on quit days. Yeah. Hope it helps. I think it's something that we all desperately need to hear, honestly. I, I really appreciate that you're just going straight to the heart of it because I think oftentimes we try to kind of sugarcoat, you know, well you know, if you're having a bad day, like, you know, but just having those really solid, honest, here's how you can pull yourself away from that. And also <clears throat> recognizing that we do have a life outside of writing and that it's really important to recognize when something is more important and needs our full attention. Sometimes. Yeah. I used to do a lecture called the five lies you told about your creativity that can kill it. Hmm. Whose tape loop is telling you you can't do this today? So if it's legitimately a life problem that you know in your heart that you need to attend to, but if it's some, some teacher or some peer, I have seen more talent ruined by other people's tape loops and then the poor person being dumped on didn't have the strength or the ferocity to fight back mm -hmm. because they lost it way too young. Yeah. They lost it way too young. And there's self-help books that can help you bring it back. Yeah. Um, Vein of Gold is one. I forget the author right offhand. Um, she talks about discovering where you lost your creativity and how it got smothered. Wonderful book. Yeah. So there's other people who've been creators who've gone before you. Um, don't listen to the ones that are discouraging. You find the ones that found their way through that maze. But above everything, don't give up yourself. Yeah. Know the worth that your voice has. Yeah. And develop it. That's totally a separate question than your voice has worth. Now you have to develop your craft enough to make it worthwhile for someone else to listen to it. Yeah. Your voice raw and unschooled and untrained and unfinished isn't worth anybody's time. So I'm separating. Yes, you have that spark of creativity that you don't give up for anybody, but it's up to you to do your homework mm -hmm. and develop it and find the voice that is going to put that spark out into the world. Right. We've got a lot of people um, in the comments that are loving the advice. Oh, I was really, really good, Jared, at not listening. It, I was the bane of my school teachers. I was the bane of my parents. I was the bane of everybody because I definitely was born thinking for myself. Oh, they hated it. You know, the history professor, you could get an A in this class if you really wanted to. And I'm going, memorizing a bunch of dates is going to make me a person. Sorry, I'm not going to bother. So yeah, I did. I left all the dates blank. And I wrote the essay and I got a C and there was nothing he was going to do to pull <laughs> yep. me off of that. I'm going to ride my horse for the hour that I would have had to spend memorizing some dates that I'm going to forget tomorrow. So yeah, I, I had a very hard head for already knowing where I wanted to go. Yeah. Well, and it's funny because when I was in college, I, I think I gave several of my professors some gray hair because I came into it. I was homeschooled all the way through high school. And when I got to college, this idea of kind of boxed academic learning was so foreign to me at that point. Um, and I went in and I asked one of my professors, I really wanted to do an audio drama with some of my classmates. And he, he was like, well, you realize you won't get any credit for this. I'm like, okay. 
<laughs> like, I just want to do it because it's something I want to do. And he was like, but, and there was, it was like this fight at every turn and it wasn't like it was costing them anything. It was just this, but that's not in the syllabus kind of idea. And it was like, well, I don't care. I you were in the wrong to college. I went yeah. to a college where we, we contracted our education. Mm. We said, here's where I want to go. Here are the books I'm going to read. Here are the classes I'm going to take. Mm. Here's this community work I'm going to do to show that I've learned it. Here's the project I'm going to do that pulls all those things together. So yeah, it taught you how to, how to design your education and taught you how to learn what you need to know. So when you're done college, any subject you want to tackle, you knew how to gain the knowledge. So you were in the wrong college because yeah, I wouldn't have survived in one like that either. Let's do 101, 102, 103. And then you decide if you like your career, you just pissed away three years of your time. <laughs> I said, send me to 103. I will catch up one and one and 102 during that semester. I'll pass the exam and I'll know if I want this career or not. Right. But that kind of thinking is not, no, it's a little uncontrollable. Yeah. Uh, Began says, as a first-time writer, it's so refreshing to hear a veteran author actually point to helpful resources and practical advice instead of airing out some mysterious, unattainable nonsense. Yeah, well, those people haven't done enough deep, deep thinking to understand what works and what doesn't. I don't know. I I didn't have much. Sorry, if if I'm in a room and people start bullshitting and laying down rules, I'm usually daydreaming. I'm out of there. My brain just <laughs> checks out. I said I'm gone. <laughs> I've been stuck on writing a dialogue for about two weeks now. I needed to hear that. Awesome. Start a fight in the middle of it, then it'll work. <laughs> you can always cut the fight out once yeah. it starts to work. But yeah. Pause points is brilliant. I had a long pause on my book, but when I figured it out, I flew through the rest of the manuscript. Yeah, the trick is knowing what kind of resistance you're hitting. Mm -hmm. Which of those various things. And I had a long time to think about it. Yeah. You know, when you're a professional writer for this many years, you don't have time to fool around. You've got to at least make progress on a deadline. You may not make every single one on the day that the publisher wants, but you have to have some sense of where you are yeah. so that you can say to them, you know, here's our I'm at, at in the manuscript and it's not going to wind up unfinished. But so learning to work under pressure I guess I'm somewhat of a deep thinker. I keep digging at stuff until I figure out what is actually happening, you know, tracking yeah. your own thoughts. So I've yeah. had a lot of practice at this. Yeah. Yeah. And any woman writing up against professional pressure, being dismissed, working on other things to the side to pay the bills, operating in a male dominated world, you learn to sift through what is bullshit and what is not. And so mm -hmm. I think that pushes you to dig deeper where somebody else that has everything that's accepted with, without any questions, mm -hmm. we have to push harder yeah. to be heard. Yeah. And so understanding where we are in our process can help fight off some of the pressures that you inevitably encounter For sure. just as a pro, even just a negative review. Does that review mean anything or not? Mm-hmm. Knowing what you what you put on the page, why you did it, how you developed your skill to do it, it's really easy to tell if, if the book missed because the person reading it wasn't suited to what you were doing or didn't have the patience to take the time to see and let go of their own life and take it, what was on the page, and let that story take them. Not everybody wants to do that. Not everybody wants to lose control. My books demand that you lose control. Mm -hmm. And I get a lot of reader resistance because of that. They can't let go of how they feel about this character. I want you to feel what the character feels. Mm. And my books will not allow you to carry your little basket of prejudice along with it. It's going to blow it up in your face. And so a lot of readers are just not suited for that because they're terrified to let go. And that's mm -hmm. okay for them. Doesn't affect me. Doesn't change what I put on the page. It just means that the match didn't work. Mm -hmm. I write very visually. There are people with aphantasia that cannot visualize anything. Mm. And they go, I can't wade through this description. Yeah. I can't do it. It's boring. Well, yeah, if you can't visualize. On the other hand, I've had people write me back and say, I couldn't visualize at the beginning of your books, but by the end of them, I sure could. Mm. It changed their brain. But yeah. they were willing to let go and ride with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Well, and I think, you know, for me at least, what I hope whenever I pick up a new story is for it to teach me something. Even if it's something small, I want to be have something left behind by everything I read, whether it's something that I'm reaffirmed in something I already believe or I'm in, you know, kind of brought into a space where I can think of something in a new way. And I think, you know, the idea of I, I've never I, I do have a little bit of a writing editor in my head, I think, when I read, but I think a lot less because I've continued to really pour myself into the reading and reviewing side of like with my YouTube channel and everything that's kind of kept me out of that completely. So I haven't really had a full, I can't read anything because of my editor, which I'm very grateful for because I'm loving <laughs> being able to read all of these incredible stories by other people. It'll fade as you go along too, more. Yeah. Where there's such huge things that are inept Right. Um, I don't read too many of those. There's something good in just about everything that I read. Mm -hmm. And like you said, the indie book writing community has come so far. But, you know, I just finished your book, Phased. Thank you. And one of the, <laughs> the values that I saw in this book was people from dysfunctional families that don't have a sibling relationship mm -hmm. like your two sisters do, that will protect each other, that will go to bat for each other, that will give up everything to keep their relationship stable. Not everybody has had that experience. Yeah. And so your, your read here, even though you say, well, it's a YA, it's a high school book, it's another, it can't be dismissed because there's, a, there's threads of things in there that a person growing up without that experience could say, wow, this is what having a functional relationship with a sister could be like. Yeah. And it will open up both what they missed, but also a facet of, existence and living that they wouldn't have gotten to experience except for you're sharing it in a story. So yeah. often the book that you go, this isn't for me, I hate it. Why do you hate it? Because that grain of sand is going to have something valuable in it for you. Yeah. Something that one time you loved and somebody kicked it to the curb or some experience that you said, I don't want to repeat, but there's still energy left in that experience. Yeah. And it's causing adverse static in a book. What's it doing to you in real life? So yeah. whenever I hit a book that really, really puts my back up as far as writing about something that I go, I just hate this. I will look at why, because it's some thing is locked up and frozen in my real life that that book triggered. Now I'm not mm -hmm. talking about style or being triggered by how a book is written. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you just don't agree with how a book is written. I'm talking about the core of the book, how yeah. it made you feel or what topic it was addressing and why did you have that massive adverse reaction? You're Often right. there's a key to yourself locked in that. It has nothing to do with the book, it has everything to do with you. Yeah. Yeah. Reading teaches us a lot about ourselves. <laughs> P.L. Stewart wants to know, can't believe I've never asked you this, Jannie. To what do you attribute your incredible vocabulary? Uh, because I didn't read popular paperback books growing up until later. I read the mm -hmm. library. I went to the library and I would check out about 12 books a week and I would burn through all my allowance on flashlight batteries reading under the covers. <laughs> and I did not read fantasy and science fiction until much later. Mm. So I read, and then I got into my father's paperbacks that he would buy. So I read John D. McDonald and I read trash books and I read mysteries and I read every possible thing. I mean, I read The Agony and the Ecstasy at 14. <laughs> yeah. That's where my vocabulary came from. And I didn't use the dictionary. I absorbed it through the skin. I absorbed it by reading context. I absorbed it by just reading and reading and reading and reading and reading until the point where my books went to my copy editors who had been in the business for umpty decades. And they said, you have the most pristine use of the English language we've ever seen. So when I said, go out there and read, if you want to write, do it. Mm -hmm. And if it's a 19th century book and the style's really stiff, well, the manners were at that time period too. Immerse mm -hmm. yourself in the society and feel how different it was. Yeah. And then rebel against it in your next novel if you want to. <laughs> But I, I absorbed it all by reading. Yeah. And not reading what was popular, what was mainstream, what was 
considered beach reads. I read everything. Mm -hmm. So the Iliad, the Odyssey, all kinds of classics, all kinds of mythology, all kinds of, I mean, when I was growing up, the fantasy genre did not exist. Mm -hmm. Tolkien was just getting going and it was niche. I didn't read Tolkien until I was about 14 or 15. So go and read. Mm -hmm. Read all the older, you know, Sutcliffe and Costain and Mary Stewart and read some of the, uh, and older than that, Gormenghast, go back and read Islandia by Austin Tappan Wright. He invented his whole universe just like Tolkien did, but he's very little known. Mm. So read some of the hard books. Go read Shakespeare. Get into it. Yeah. Because, you know, words are like tools. They're very, very precise. And you can bring a sharpness to your writing if you have the precise tool in hand. So when people go, oh, yeah, just write in this sanded off modern English, you've thrown away. Mm -hmm. Some of the most precision tools in the drawer literally squeeze the juice out of the language that you had available to you. Read the letters of people who went and wrote home during the Civil War. Mm -hmm. You'll be astonished at the vocabulary used day to day in those time periods. Yeah. So there was a, a period when I was probably in my early teens when Time Magazine, Life Magazine, all the major mag news magazines decided unilaterally, they were going to write at fourth grade or third grade le reading level. And they literally dumbed down the language in their magazines on purpose. Mm. And that became the news norm. Instead of making people stretch up and learn reading, they decided to dumb it down. And that's where I saw a lot of the change in how popular books were written mm -hmm. originated right there it was a conscious decision to quote, make everything more accessible, but making it more accessible does not make it richer, mm -hmm. does not make it more powerful. It actually weakens it by sanding the edges off. So to me, no, no two words are alike. Mm -hmm. And if you can't accept that, if you believe so strongly that you don't want to use the precise language and what that can give you, then go read some other book because my work isn't for you. Mm -hmm. Chris says, I needed to hear this. I was better at separating the creator from the editor mind when I was younger. As a mom with young kids, I'm really inspired by their creativity at the ages they're at because they have such an unbridled enthusiasm for learning at this point and creativity and they don't edit themselves. Very, very slight sometimes, but there's there's just this kind of wild, unhinged creativity that's so fun to get to watch. They haven't told been told it was bad yet. Right. Hopefully they will never hear that from me. <laughs> They'll hear it from their teachers. Yeah. My children are homeschooled, so that that at least helps. Oh, that helps. Yeah. <laughs> I remember in third grade I was screamed at for using words that Mm. I was not supposed to use, and I wasn't using four letters. I was using vocabulary. Right. Because I was reading at home. And uh, boy, did it stick with me. Mm -hmm. That little voice saying, you know, shut up. Yep. So, yeah, you have to prepare your kids for the real world because if they aren't getting it in homeschooling, they're going to hit it later in life. You're right. Their boss is going to tell them or their whatever, their best friend's going to tell them. Somebody will because they got that box drawn around them and they accepted it. And now with crabs in the mm -hmm. bucket, we got to pull you into our cage too. How dare you? Yeah. How dare you step outside? Yeah. And they get quite vicious about it and only because they're terrified. Yeah. Yeah. I've I, said I, for, I, for years, creativity is a lone wolf pursuit. It is. And you are going to step out of the pack and you are going to lead your own dance. Mm -hmm. And everybody to make you safe is going to try to pull you back. Everybody on some level or another, everybody is going to try to pull you back because you're doing something dangerous. Your survival instinct says you don't live alone. Mm -hmm. So society is going to make it hard for you to run as the lone wolf and creativity demands that. So you need to develop that strength to be able to say, sorry, bye-bye, stay in your bag box, I'm gone. 
Right. And finding, you know, the other people that have the similar drive and, and, you know, passion for creativity, hopefully that you do so that it's, you're still in your own space creating, but you have kind of a community at large. If you're lucky, if you're lucky, you have that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you might go decades without. Yeah. I know I did. You know, I didn't have family support for what I was doing when I was, I was single till 38 because I couldn't find any dating support for what I was doing. And every time mm -hmm. they would draw the box around me, I go, bye-bye. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Hold on. laughs> rather be, I'd rather be doing my creativity than hanging around with a bozo that tells me what to think. Mm -hmm. Sorry, no. So, you know, prepare yourself that you yeah. might not have that community. The internet helps. Mm -hmm. But at any moment, some bozo in the big tech company can screw around with the internet and then what? Mm -hmm. So you better learn to reinvent that resilience yourself because you might not always have that family around you. Yeah. I'm talking found family, not blood family, though some people are lucky enough to have that. Yeah. You know, my mother was my biggest fan, some people say. Mine wasn't, <laughs> you know, God bless her. She taught me to be independent really early because of that. So I gained from that experience. Mm -hmm. So if your found family is, is where it's at, go with that, but they may not be there for you forever. Right. Yeah. You have to find a resilience in yourself to keep going regardless of who's around you. Yeah. Especially if you're breaking out and go in a new direction. Right. And that found family you have can't go that far. Then you might have to just say time to walk away and make a new one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, that's a shame, Andrew, because you know what? It isn't dead. You could wake that back up again and go and do it. Go for it. I've I've warned him I'm going to bother him <laughs> until he tries. Go find that book called Vein of Gold. If I'm trying to remember the name of the author. Julia Vein of Cameron? Gold. Yeah. Read that book. All right. Re if you've lost your creativity or you think you gave it up or you think it's too late or you think that it was shut down, that book will teach you how to rewake it back up again. It's a beautifully written book. So don't let what you were told at 11 when you didn't have the adult in the room that could say, shut the F up. <laughs> well, you're born knowing what you want to do. Honestly, you are. That curiosity, that boundless curiosity the child has is going to find what they love to do. It's just so often that what they love to do doesn't fit with what the adults around them think is important. Right. And it's just criminally easy to shut that down. Yep. But if you're still alive, it is not gone. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. <laughs> and it didn't, <laughs> I hope it didn't level. work. <laughs> Yeah, you know what? It's it's funny because I think so many people don't understand creative pursuits like that. When you it's a it's fine as a hobby typically, you know, but but as soon as you say no, this is what I want to do with my life. It's amazing how people discredit that very quickly. Well, they do because it's not safe. I'm laughing at Matt's comment here. You were horrible at writing and you hated it, but now you spend a lot of your time reviewing books for nothing on the internet. <laughs> Whoa, that's a real turn. It is, yep. So yeah, it's totally a personal journey, but I see so many people who live their whole life and never pursue their personal journey because somebody kicked them off the track. Mm-hmm. Same. And they're hurt so bad inside, all they can do is kick everybody else off the track too so that everybody else can be miserable too. It is not easy in this crowded, opinionated world to find yourself mm -hmm. because you have a thousand voices barraging you, telling you that what you're thinking isn't important. And mm -hmm. you talk to any child that hasn't been screwed up that way, they know what's important. They're going to outgrow what isn't important. You don't have to fixate on one career. You can change three or four times in your lifetime if you want to. I mean, who made up all these rules? <laughs> T 
Baggins wants to know, can you offer advice on knowing when your current project isn't right? I got 110,000 words into a novel and realized I wasn't equal to what I wanted to produce. So I stepped back and started another. Well, then we start a dialogue. Why did you feel you weren't equal to it? Mm. Answer that. Why did you feel you were not equal to it? Whose tape loop said you couldn't do this? What created that intimidated feeling that you weren't up to the project? Because frankly, your brain is boundless. So is the universe. If you decide you're going to do it, you will get yourself there. It might not happen all at once. So what mm -hmm. convinced you that you were not equal to it? Was it that arrogance that said, I don't deserve this? Was it that somebody else's tape loop saying you're not smart enough or you're not this or you're not that? What were you not? Mm -hmm. So you step back and started another. If you don't know what made you feel you weren't equal to it, you might find the same thing happened again at the next 110,000 words. Now, if you realize you weren't equal to it because you were boring yourself because that wasn't the story you really wanted to tell, that's a story reason. So answer the next question, what story did you really want to tell? Mm -hmm. I've also seen people lock up on a novel because they wrote an outline and by God, that novel better stick to it. <laughs> Sometimes, yep. sorry, the novel you thought you were going to write is not the novel. And yep. if it wants to bend left and go into some other area, let it go mm -hmm. and see where it's going to take you because that is your intuitive creativity at work. And if you turn on your editor and say, oh, we're off the outline, screw it. You just shut down the very vein of gold that you were pursuing. Mm -hmm. So chase it because once you see where that novel is taking you, you realize now I understand the idea I really wanted to write. Now you can put the editor in place and correct course and make the rest of the book fit where your intuitive creativity was trying to take you. So why weren't you equal to what you wanted to produce? That is the critical question. And unless you get to the bottom of it, you run the risk of botting me out again and again and again. Whose tape loop was it? Exactly what made you feel that way? Answer that and it may either unlock that work, let it shoot off in a direction it wasn't supposed to go, <laughs> or maybe starting fresh is what you really needed to do, but you, I think you honestly need to know. Yeah. Well, and I think too, like, you know, the follow-up comment about my own tape loop I had and still have a vision, but don't feel I can execute in a way from my own experience, which is admittedly far less than Janie's. Um, that's kind of what I did with, with phased was I had an epic fantasy in my head but I wasn't, I wasn't quite there yet mentally. And I knew that I wanted to be, and I knew I would get there, but I needed something in the interim to kind of let me play a little bit and unlock some of the creative parts of my brain that I felt like needed more growth. Um, and after being phased, when I jumped back into the epic fantasy, it was a whole different experience. And it had really kind of spurred extra creativity and allowed me to jump into a place that I hadn't been able to find before. There's another facet to this, and that's what I call the devil voice. There's a devil voice in every project, and it's probably most apparent in when I work visually and I draw and I paint. Mm. But it's definitely true when, I, when you write, but writing is so sequential, it's harder to see it. <laughs> a painting is already there. When you start a drawing, it's already there. You look at it, and the little devil voice editor gets in there and gets in your face and says, this is irredeemably awful. <laughs> it does yeah. not look like the vision that I started with. It's incredibly clumsy. I'll never save it. Mm -hmm. That's the devil voice. And it's going to happen probably one third of the way through to two thirds of the way through every project you ever do. You better get a big hammer and bash that sucker mm -hmm. because you have to push through that resistance. Yep. And when you do, the project is going to redeem itself. It may never be the vision you started out with on day one. It may always have a clumsiness to it that you never envisioned at day one, but there will be some piece of magic that falls into place by the time you get to the end of it that says, whoa, this was worth doing. Absolutely mm -hmm. was worth doing. So if you're 
falling prey to the devil voice. You need a big hammer. And if you have breakable things in your room, then you need one of these, which is an F-bomb that a friend of mine gave me. And it's Nerf. <laughs> so you can throw it at your computer and say, devil voice, get the hell out of here and not hurt your computer. <laughs> so yeah, That's I recommend a crocheted F-bomb. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Yeah, Elaine, the hot mess phase of artwork. Yes. And I was laughing yes. when you were talking about that because my best friend, Sarah uh, Sparrow Springs, she is an illustrator as well. And I've we've had many conversations about that point in artwork, whether it's the book or the, you know, like you said, the visual art. I think people don't understand that what drives talent is not talent. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I hate to kill that myth, squash that bug. It is not talent. What drives talent is desire, mm. an unquenchable desire, the enthusiasm to keep going after it and going after it and going after it because you grow the neurons in your brain very slowly. When you're born, you have billions of connections in your brain that are all connected. And one by one, you eliminate them as you learn things and you throw away the ones you don't use. Mm -hmm. Then the idiot quitters tell you, oh, you can't grow any new ones. This is wrong. You can. What grows the neurons in your brain is practice. So as Don's teacher told him, my husband Don is an artist, the first thousand are the hardest. <laughs> if I showed you the drawings that I began with, you would say this person could never paint, mm -hmm. never illustrate a book cover. If I showed you the, the writing that I did when I was in high school, you would say this person is a complete failure as a novelist. Practice yep. develops the neurons in the brain. And one thing you need to understand as you get older, it takes longer to grow the connections mm. because you've eliminated more of them. So building new connections. So it takes a long time. And so I've had this ridiculous habit of every five years, I try to start up something totally new. So I don't mm. ever forget what it feels like to be stupid. <laughs> Because when we get older, we don't like to look dumb. So we don't want to be ignorant. We don't want to be a beginner at anything. So we keep falling back into our same group. So I said, every five years, I'm going to start something new that I've never done before. And I'll just be dumb at it until I learn. And one thing I've noticed is it can be incredibly frustrating because you work with whatever practice you're doing. I mean, I was teaching myself to play. I played bagpipes for years in pipe band. I decided I'd take on drumming just to see what the drummers were doing. Every day when I finished practice, I would have it. And then the next day it was gone. Mm. And I kept having to start over and start over and our start until one day, boom, those connections had become solid and I could progress. There is a learning plateau to writing. There is a learning plateau to drawing. There's a learning plateau while you're waiting to grow that neural connection. Yeah. And it's incredibly frustrating because it seems like everything you learned yesterday got erased today. Mm -hmm. It didn't but you have to persist. So nevertheless, she persisted. You need to paste that on your wall in big red letters because you are capable of learning new things. What was it? Somebody said, we don't get old because we don't, we, for, we, we don't get old because we stop playing. We get old because we forget how to play. Mm -hmm. We don't forget how to play. We stop playing. So yeah. creativity is playful. Yeah. And, and playfulness does stupid things. So get off being dumb. You need to, you need to not be afraid to be ignorant. Right. Yeah. And it can take time to learn. So if you want to draw, draw. I guarantee you by the end of the year, if you've done a drawing every single day, by the end of one year, you'll have something by the end of five years, you'll be amazing. Mm -hmm. And what keeps you coming back is the love of doing it. The enthusiasm, that's the genuine spark, the desire mm -hmm. to be there. That's what drives talent, not talent. We all have talent. Every human being born on this planet has talent. It's whether it gets developed or not. And that's up to you. Yeah. <laughs> if you listen to Janny for five minutes, all the things you convinced yourself your whole life you could not do, you will become a believer in yourself. I totally believe that, PL. I'm sitting over here like, yes, I can do anything. <laughs> You can, you can. When I was in high school, I took every scrap of money that I saved up because of something that I saw in a presentation. And I sent myself at 17 to outward bound school. 
This was Outward Bound School before it got watered down, before they'd had some deaths and they had to pull back and make it easier. Mm -hmm. The original premise behind the Outward Bound School was in World War II, there were people who were shipwrecked in the Navy. And what they noticed was the 20 year olds were dying in the life rafts. The 40 mm -hmm. year olds were surviving. Mm -hmm. And they're going, this is wrong. You would think it'd be the other way around. And what they discovered when they dug into the psychology of it, the 20 year olds had never been stressed hard enough in their life to break. Mm -hmm. They didn't believe that they could make it. They'd never suffered enough hardship. They'd never hit rock bottom to discover that reservoir that's underneath rock bottom that every person has. Yeah. So they gave up. They psychologically, mentally gave up. So Outward Bound was designed in a 28 day course to break every limit you had, throw you to rock bottom and force you to tap into that reservoir that was below, push you past that limit until you realize that those limits were completely elastic. Mm -hmm. I did this at 17 years old and I realized Limits are bullshit. <laughs> it's how hard ahead do you have to ram through it? Because we always have been hearing stories all our lives about the resiliency of the human spirit. Those people are no different than you. They just mm -hmm. found the strength to step past that point where they believed they couldn't go any further. Yeah. And then they found that reservoir and they did. So there you go that resiliency to reinvent what you think is your limit. I learned that rather early and I already had a pretty hard headed attitude about, I know what I want to do, screw what people are telling me. So I recommend any program that does that mm -hmm. pushes you off the deep end and forces you to swim. And they did it in a really rough way. They would spend an afternoon teaching us how to belay with ropes. And then they would throw us over a 200 foot cliff and then they'd put somebody in a basket and you'd have one guy in a basket, helpless, six guys who were just taught how to handle ropes, getting that person in that basket down a 200 foot cliff. And if they screwed up with what they learned, somebody died. It was serious. Yeah. The terror of having that life in your hands with something yeah. you just learned or the terror of being that guy in the basket where if your five teammates dropped the ball, you were gone. Um, they did it by pushing you past your limits of your fear, pushing you past your limits of endurance, pushing you past the limits of isolation. It was not an easy course. It was mm -hmm. not comfortable. But you came out of it saying, what if I was doing all of this with somebody firing bullets at me? Mm -hmm. Now you have a clue about what some of these people who are going to war, a clue of what they have to face. Right. Because just surviving in a situation where you're not under any other threat can be difficult enough. So understanding that limits are somebody, some, something somebody told you or something mm -hmm. you haven't experienced yet, it's valuable to break, shatter that glass. Absolutely. Yaniv says, Janny, your words are golden and really inspiring. Thank you. And I keep hearing great things about your work in Completed Depth Series. Well, thank you, because I didn't pull any punches in those books. <laughs> Derry. Hi, Derry. I agree, Yana. I had a stroke years ago, and it's seriously impacted my ability to take in new things, and I've had to learn how to learn all over again. And it sure isn't easy. And it can take time. I mean, my brother suffered a debilitating stroke a couple of years ago. Learning that isn't linear either because one day you'll master something and then the next day it'll be gone and then it'll be there for a month and then it'll be gone again. It's very erratic, you plateau or it races out from under you. I have to hand it to you because recovering from something that serious is very, very hard and it's not easy and not giving up is paramount. Mm -hmm. So I honor your persistence. Well, and Derry is such a huge pillar of the community with with um, just honestly, most of my circle on BookTube, Derry is a huge pillar of that community. So there's nothing like overcoming any kind of a disability to teach you to respect and honor what other people are going through. There's nothing more valuable than being a minority or being the outsider 
-hmm. in any situation to teach you empathy Mm -hmm. for what other people might be going through. And the people who've never experienced that, honestly, they haven't grown. Mm -hmm. That's why age is a number, right? Because you can have someone very young who's experienced a lot and you can have somebody who's older who, you know, is just starting to have some of the same experiences. And it's, it's such a individual, like you said, I mean, there's no boxes there either. <laughs> well, and all the crazy things that I've done, I've had a few experiences that were just off the wall crazy. Mm. Um, and if I hadn't persisted and bounced back, I wouldn't be here. Yeah. So, you know, I've tested the extreme limits of a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I have a lot of respect for people who encounter difficulties like that, because if you listen to them, they have a lot that they can teach you mm-hmm. about what life is okay. really is and what really means, what things really have meaning. Mm-hmm. Because you aren't going to really understand what really has meaning until you lose it all. And the cheap course for that is to do something like go offshore sailing mm-hmm. on a small boat, because suddenly a lot of things are not going to have meaning anymore that you thought were important. And some things that you thought you'd gotten over or you were past it or weren't important suddenly might be the first thing you think about when mm-hmm. you're in a survival situation and that big storm hits and you've got to react correctly or that boat's going down right. or you're going to get damaged. So there are cheap ways to get that experience, um, not without risk, but <laughs> listen to the people who've had that experience in their lives because they will have a depth to them and hopefully they can pass some facet of that on without having you having to go there too. Yeah. And that requires us to really open our ears and, you know, be active listeners in the relationships that we form because every person has something to teach you. And yeah, it's, there's so much to learn from every person that you meet. Derry, thank you, Jenny. I've finally been able to read new books in the last year or so, and it's been like gaining an entire sense back. That's awesome, oh, Derry. There you go. Zen, I was born legally blind because of albinism, so that I'm able to read it all is because of technology. Yep, and I bet you appreciate it so much more as a result because you know what it would be like without it. Mm-hmm. Everybody else is going to take for granted what for you is a gift. Yep. And Zen is a Zen is a readathon champion reader, so <laughs> he didn't let it stop him. Well, I just want to thank you so much, Jannie, for for generously giving your time to be on here. And I just I'm I'm just kind of absorbing and soaking in everything you've been saying because I think it honestly, all of us as creatives need to hear this, but there were a couple of comments to this in the chat earlier, and I totally agree that I feel like so much of this goes so far past creativity and just into advice for life and experiencing things. And I'm very, very grateful to have had the opportunity to um, to get a chance to talk to you on my channel. So well, thank it was you. wonderful to be invited here. I want to add that on my website are a couple of resources for you people. Yes. There is a tips for aspiring writers and trips for aspiring artists. Those sections have a lot of what we talked about and not everything, but there are also sections in there that are specifically tailored for writers. I was talking to Tori earlier before we started about how my copy editors who were in the business for decades and decades Mm -hmm. provided a list of common errors that if every author observed what they found as common errors, it would save their copy editors an enormous amount of grief. And it would also save some of the younger copy editors who don't have their long in the tooth experience. Mm -hmm. This list is posted all the common errors that writers make or people make with language. It is downloadable. Please use it. They wanted, they begged and pleaded that they use, that you use it. Um, It's their lifetime's experience handed to you on a plate. I also have proofreaders marks, professional proofreaders marks. So if you're marking up something for the typesetter, this is how you do it. It's the language of how you make corrections to a manuscript. Mm -hmm. And I know we don't typeset anymore. We mostly go from electronic files, but there's page proofs where it's already been set Mm -hmm. and you might have to make a mark like that. So there's a lot of little things there that are helpful. 
um, go ahead and check it out. It's free. Yes, and to everybody in the chat or watching this as a replay, down in the description box below is the link straight to Jannie's website. So all you have to do is go down in the description box and click on it, and you'll be able to go right to um, her homepage. I'm the only Jannie Wirtz in the world. If you spell it correctly, <laughs> you will find the official website pretty easily. Derry says, thank you so much for your generosity and sharing your insights, Jannie. It's hugely appreciated. Oh, you're Chris. welcome. Wonderful. Thanks, Tori and Janny. Have a great day, everyone. John, this is awesome. Janny is my new spirit animal. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm going to be coming back to watch this uh, this conversation multiple times in the near future as I'm getting ready to <laughs> kind of launch my fantasy career here. I'm going to need that pep talk. <laughs> So yeah, coming up tomorrow, we have a Storm Force Fortress discussion on Angie's channel and on, I think later in the afternoon, P.L. Stewart's deep dive into his Lord and King. Yes. So this weekend is going to be a fun time for me. I get to talk to lots of people that I love. Yeah. That's, that's one, hands down, been my favorite part of getting on booktube and specifically in this community is just the discussions and being able to meet people and and have really in-depth discussions about something that we all love there's there's nothing like that it's such a cool experience oh it's letting us have a, a little party all the time <laughs> yeah exactly And after the pandemic and we live in a country property in a very red state so it's really nice to be able to talk to other creative people. I enjoy this tremendously. It's always amazing fun. Yeah. Well, thank you everybody for joining us in the chat. Thank you for your awesome questions and comments. Jannie, again, thank you so much for just graciously sharing your time with us today. I really appreciate that. You're welcome. And thank you for the great read in Phased. <laughs> thank you. Bye everybody.